So the guardrails that liberal democracies put in place for these sorts of situations, so that even if a party with extreme views on immigration comes to power, that the institutions in a society are still strong enough to prevent uh, violent and, and reactionary policies from, from being implemented, that's important. And short of, of these sort of violent or genocidal whims, which we see in places like Nazi Germany or the expulsions that occurred in a place like Uganda under Idi Amin or the 1990s in the Balkans, or we talked about the Philippine example earlier, um, you know, there are very scary, dangerous, violent consequences to simply allowing the, the whim of the majority at any given moment uh, from turning into policy. Welcome to Deep Dive with me, Sean Fettig. I'm a political scientist, and I'm interested in how our government and our politicians influence our lives, but also how our personal stories influence our politics. In this podcast, I may focus on topics in the news, but this is not punditry. Instead, I dive deep into issues and stories with my guests behind the headlines, beyond the basic narrative that is often crafted by the media and our politicians, to help us better understand each other and why we think and feel the ways we do. Today's episode is the final part of my three-part miniseries, my pursuit of understanding this far-right nationalist movement that motivates Trump supporters, contemporary Republican voters. In the first part, I spoke with Arlie Hochschild, and we talked about the sense of loss that these supporters harbor, that they missed out on the promise of the American dream, and that what's worse, people less deserving were given a leg up ahead of them by the government, enabling them to bypass them in the proverbial line to advancement ultimately that their chance was stolen from them. In the second part, I spoke to Philip Gorski about the role that white Christian nationalism has played in the trajectory of this movement, that white evangelicals have come to embrace a virulent form of nationalism that is rooted in blood and soil and not in shared civic or democratic values. And this allows them to construct an emotional and intellectual bridge, separating them from other Americans broadly and specifically connecting them to coalition partners that are beyond the pale and ostensibly make for odd bedfellows, white supremacists, and violent, xenophobic, and racist anarchists. But this phenomenon is not limited to the United States. There are companion movements arguably more deeply rooted and historical, gaining traction in other countries, like Australia, South Korea, South Africa, and also across Europe in places like Italy, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the UK. And so today I'm talking to Dr. Sasha Polakow Saransky, Deputy Editor of Foreign Policy Magazine and author of the 2017 book, Go Back to Where You Came From, The Backlash Against Immigration and the Fate of Western Democracy. This book is an indictment of the nationalist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant movements coalescing around the globe. It traces the origins of these movements, what has contributed to their rise, how politicians and activists have preyed upon and exploited very real concerns twisting them into something violent and destructive for not only the folks that exist outside of the in-group narrative, but of liberal democracy, maybe just democracy itself. We also discuss why this matters and how to bring these people back into some sensible realm of policymaking that doesn't lay waste to the very values and principles and ideals that form the bedrock of our democratic systems. Incidentally, I was struck by Dr. Polakow Saransky's identification of the Great Replacement Theory as being a driving factor behind these movements well before it became the grievance grail of Republican messaging that it is today in the United States. Let's do a deep dive. So, Dr. Polakow Saransky, thanks for taking the time to be here and chat with me. I know you're a busy man, so how are you? I'm all right. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So, most of the conversation that we're going to have is going to center around your your book and, and and the insight therein. And the book is Go Back to Where You Came From, or at least your second book, right? So Go Back to Where You Came From, uh, The Backlash Against Immigration and the Fate of Western Democracy. And I think the subtitle is incredibly important here. Yes. So this book was published in 2017, and a lot has happened since. So I want to talk about the arguments you're making, some implications in this kind of changing landscape. And then I suppose maybe hone in a bit on that final part of the subtitle, The Fate of Western Democracy. But to start off, I think there's a distinction that has to be made to understand why this conversation about immigration even really matters. And so that distinction is kind of embedded in this. So 
to your average small D Democrat, democracy is somewhat crudely, you know, identified or, or defined as majority will. And so in that landscape, even quote unquote losers will accept the outcomes if it reflects what the majority wants. But liberal democracy goes a step further and includes things like rule of law and protection of human rights, you know, something like separation of powers, et cetera. And it's here where I think a lot of nationalist anti-immigrant policies kind of run a bit afoul. So, um, you know, the average Democrat is unfamiliar with the tenets of a liberal democracy, I think. It provides an opportunity then for nationalist politicians and elites to exploit policies that might reflect, you know, quote unquote democracy, but not liberal democracy. So I've taken an initial stab at it. But can you explain the difference between democracy and liberal democracy? And then also why that difference matters with respect to policymaking and equity and, and I suppose specific to immigration policy? Sure. Well, I think the most basic distinction is between purely majoritarian democracy and a form of democracy that enshrines the rights of the losers, of minority groups of all sorts who may not be represented by whoever wins an election. And crudely majoritarian democracy would mean that, that the winner's will goes no matter what. They could expel groups of people that they don't like. They could jail pe groups of people they don't like. They could strip rights or citizenship from groups of people who they don't like. And what's ironic about some of the calls from nationalists who object to immigration and who object to other tenets of liberal democracy is that most advanced, wealthy Western countries are liberal democracies and have these sorts of rights enshrined in their constitutions, or if they don't have constitutions, their basic legal systems. And so to call for simply majoritarian democracy in a place like the United States or the UK or Australia is actually a demand for regression. It's a turning back and a, a, a flight from centuries of, of sort of hard fought battles and uh, a system that's been constructed to create checks and balances, to enshrine minority rights, to allow for a government that's elected by a majority to rule, but without trampling on the rights of everyone else. And this is at the center of the debates that established the United States. It's at the center of most European countries' recent histories, some of them very recent in the case of Germany. You can also look to countries like South Africa that are emerging from periods of totalitarian minority rule that enshrine these basic constitutional rights in order to create a liberal democracy that protects the rights of all citizens. And so I think that crude majoritarianism is actually something that you see elsewhere in the world in, in various countries that we tend to think of as less than democratic or failing democracies. And so if you look at the Philippines under Duterte, for example, when the state decided to go on a rampage against drug dealers, mm -hmm. there you have an example of what I would call crude majoritarianism. One guy wins, he decides what he wants to do. And if that means killing a certain group of people, so be it. And what a liberal democracy does is it creates checks and balances that hopefully prevent those sorts of things from happening. And the countries that I wrote about in this book, Germany, France, the Netherlands, to some extent, South Africa, the United States, uh, Denmark, these are liberal democratic states that have gone through all of this and thought very carefully about it in creating their constitutions and legal systems. And so I think that while your question is very important for setting this up, I also think that anyone arguing for crude majoritarianism in a country like the U.S. or France is, is, is being disingenuous to begin with because they're essentially saying that these countries should throw away centuries of tradition. So it strikes me that a liberal democracy is particularly, I mean, outside of just the value of liberal democracy, it's particularly functionally important in multicultural and pluralistic societies. Yes. And I'm wondering if democracy, you know, having, you know, cleaving off liberal from democracy, if we see constitutions or we see countries that are democratic, but are less multicultural and less pluralistic, so more unicultural, mm -hmm. if a constitution that kind of revolves around simply democracy 
not so much on the liberal component, functions just fine because they don't have the same type of tension. I see where you're going with her, but take... Let, let's take an example of, of a country that's quite homogenous. For example, a place like... I'm thinking of like South Korea. Okay, let's take South Korea. So South Korea actually has had some pretty xenophobic backlashes against uh, the rare immigrant groups that show up. I remember a situation a few years ago when Yemeni refugees somehow made their way to South Korea and there was a giant backlash against it. But, you know... It's not just a matter of protecting the rights of minority groups, because you're right that in certain countries there's not a large minority presence. But it's also about the rule of law. It's also about checks and balances. Right. Um, there are all sorts of, of, of legal protections that are important in a country that only has one ethnic group or very small minority populations. And those are valuable because they protect that population from any single political party or leader gaining unchecked power and using it to trample the rights of, of the rest of the citizenry. And so I think that it is something that comes into play around minority rights in multicultural societies. You're absolutely right. And the debates can become more fraught in multicultural societies because the so-called native group that is a majority population uh, can assert itself loudly mm -hmm. and in a way that's politically resonant and allows them to gain majorities, for example, arguing that you know, we, should, we should restrict the number of immigrants, we should reduce the number of refugees. If these people from other countries come into our country, they shouldn't have the same rights to us in terms of access to health care or welfare. Uh, those are all arguments that you see coming to the fore in liberal democracies where nationalist and, and nativist political parties have become powerful, especially in Europe. But the, the institutional element of it, the checks and balances, the legal structures, the rule of law, these are more fundamental. And those structures protect minority rights, but they do a lot of other things too. And so I think that ironically, even these small D Democrats you're talking about, if you look at someone like Salvini in Italy or the newer incarnation, which we should come back to later, Giorgia Meloni, who's likely to be uh, in power in Italy in the next few months. Uh -huh. You know, these are, are, are people who, who are very opposed to immigration, who in many cases have their political roots or lineage in the fascist era or the post-fascist era. And they uh, are willing to dispense with a lot of this. But uh, even, even in those cases, a lot of these politicians aren't advocating completely trampling the Constitution and throwing it out the window. They tend to focus on elements that give protections to minority groups, but not anything that might end up hurting them or depriving them of rights if the tables turn in the future. Mm -hmm. So... I think there is a through line here to the next question, which is, so in many ways, the, the history that you trace in, go back to where you came from, of anti-immigrant attitudes in parts of the world other than the United States, and particularly Europe, reflect movements that, well, were and are successful because of their secular approach, which attracts support from mm. sectors that might otherwise be repulsed by this aspect of the rights agenda. Mm. And in the United States, I, I guess I would liken the companion movement on the right is comprised differently of a very strong, and it has a very strong religious element that alienates some of the same people that I think are integral to the success of the movement in Europe. And here I'm thinking of maybe like uh, gay folks or women. Mm -hmm. So how do you see this playing out in the States that mimics, I guess, some of the same sentiment, but with an entirely different coalition that has a highly religious backbone? It's a really excellent question. Uh, and I think there are a few observations to make first about Europe. A lot of right-wing parties in Europe did also have roots on the religious right. They, have, they still today have elements with roots in the religious right. If you look at members of, of Marine Le Pen's party in France, of the Danish People's Party in Denmark, there are still some Christian nationalists and, and really hardcore religious conservatives in these parties. But they needed to rebrand themselves in order to sell themselves to a larger public. And I think that what happened in Europe and what worked in Europe is that 
They realized at some point in the 1990s that a combination of religious conservatism and in the European case, what was more important than, than religious conservatism on the right was sort of free market liberalism. The, if you look at the ideologies of Scandinavian far right parties in the 90s, uh, also if you look at at the 80s and 90s in, in places like the Netherlands and, and France, you, you have this uh, sort of free market ideology uh, on the one hand, and this was more prevalent in Scandinavia and, and the Netherlands, and elements of, of religious conservatism, which you might see more strongly in France and Italy, uh, sort of the old Catholic right. Mm -hmm. And these parties were not gaining traction. They were never getting beyond 5 or 10% in elections. It wasn't a winning coalition. And the genius of what these politicians did between roughly 2000 and today is they built a larger coalition. And that meant peeling off voters from the center left and the center right. And the way that they did this was to shed some of that baggage. In Le Pen's case, she made a real effort to do what she called de-demonize the party and distance herself from her own father, distance herself from the anti-Semitic baggage that her father brought with her, any elements of sympathy for the Vichy government in France during the World War II era, any trace of neo-Nazism, and the, the Danish People's Party did the same thing. The Party for Freedom in Holland did the same thing. They really made an effort to, to shed that historical baggage. At the same time, they started to realize that they needed a new economic program. And I think a lot of this was strategic and opportunistic rather than ideologically driven. They realized that to get 30 or 40 percent of the vote in Le Pen's case, rather than 10 to 15 percent of the vote, she needed to, to branch out. And I interviewed Le Pen pretty extensively before the last French election in, in 2017. And, and she made a point of going into great detail about how she managed to poach ex-communist and ex-socialist voters in hard scrabble working class parts of northern and eastern France that had historically voted for the Communist Party, and if not the Communists, for the Socialists. And what she did was she deployed an economic program, or she advocated for an economic program that was in many ways further to the left than the socialists or the communists, but it was also a nativist program. And if you look at what the Danish People's Party did in Denmark, it was very similar. Uh, they were staunch defenders of the Danish welfare state, but for us, not for them. It was a nativist defense of the welfare state, what is sometimes referred to as welfare chauvinism or welfare nationalism in the political science literature. Le Pen, given her background, is reluctant to ever use the word welfare or its French equivalent, but she essentially admitted that she had created a political program that resonated with people who had looked to a strong state and who wanted a strong state, but that it was what in France is called national preference. And so this combination of shedding the historical baggage of associations with Nazis or fascists and advocating an economic program that resonated with left-wing or ex-left-wing voters really increased their numbers and really increased their electoral draw. And so I know that's long-winded, but it's important background for understanding how they went from peripheral to central political players. And at the same time, they started to openly court these groups that you're talking about that we would not traditionally think of as, as right-wing constituencies. So gay voters, Jewish voters, women voters. And the way that they did this in many places was to argue that Islam and specifically Muslim immigrants were the greatest threat to these groups. So they would cite incidents of uh, young men with North African backgrounds, for example, in the Netherlands, beating up a gay couple. They would find any statistics of rape cases involving immigrants and say this is a threat to women. And of course, anti-Semitism has been a problem both with immigrant populations and native populations in countries like France. But there have been a number of violent anti-Semitic incidents involving people who are immigrants or descended from immigrant families. And Marine Le Pen and, and her allies would bring this to the fore in the political debate and say, you Jews 
are afraid of us because of what my father used to say or who my father used to associate with, but look at who's threatening you now. It's not us, it's them. And it was very effective. It wasn't necessarily true, but it, it resonated enough that they were able to peel off some of those voters. And I think if you look at the data, you'll find that most Jews in France still do not vote for far-right parties, but some of them did. And some gay people did, and some women did, because they bought into this rhetoric. And so they, they managed to, to poach voters, if you will, um, from the left uh, by appealing to traditionally left-wing issues. But ultimately, I would argue that it was the economic policy more than these culture war issues um, that, that really resonated and brought people in large numbers. So that's a very uh, long-winded way of getting into your question about the U.S. The U.S., you're right, has a very different political landscape. And if you look at the Trump coalition, you see that there is this strong element of, of hardcore conservative Christian right-wing voters backing Trump. But those voters have traditionally backed Republican candidates. And what was different, I think, in this election is that Trump was not one of them. We all know that Trump is not religious, that Trump uh, does not subscribe to <laughs> the, the sort of hardcore Christian agenda of the religious right. They backed him for a very specific reason and have just gotten a uh, an excellent return on their investment in the form of the Supreme Court decision repealing Roe v. Wade. That's what they wanted. And that's why they went for Trump. But I don't think those voters had any illusion really about who Trump was. So there, there was a certain irony uh, to, to that coalition and that Trump was no Pat Robertson, right? He, 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 he if anything, was a decadent New York liberal who, who refashioned himself as a conservative, but managed to bring these voters along because of the promises he made on those cultural issues. What I think is interesting about your question, where I think there is some, some overlap between the European story that I just told and the, the 2016 election cycle in the US, is that Trump also disrupted the tradition. He disrupted the traditional Republican economic narrative and borrowed some of these ideas from the successful far-right parties in Europe. And it wasn't exactly the same. It wasn't a defense of the welfare state because using the phrase welfare state and defending a welfare state isn't something that resonates politically in the U.S. But if you look at Trump's rhetoric and what helped him win in places like Michigan and Wisconsin among ex-union voters in places like suburban Detroit who traditionally have voted Democratic, uh, he deployed a version of, of, of this economic nationalism that I was talking about in, in France and Denmark that resonated with them. You know, your jobs have been sent away. I'm going to bring the jobs back. Uh, these auto jobs shouldn't be in Mexico. They should be in Detroit. Those kinds of statements are very similar to what you saw in Europe. And even if the promises weren't kept, uh, it resonated with voters who felt like they had been left behind and who felt like the left the Democratic Party had gone all in on globalization and forgotten about them. And here comes Trump saying, I'm going to restore American greatness. I'm going to restore American jobs. And I'm going to look out for you, the worker, the little guy. And that rhetoric is quite similar. And it was a departure from the traditional Republican narrative of lower taxes, pro-business. And that form of economic populism worked, and I would argue, in some respects, was more important than the draw he had for Christian conservatives, because the Christian conservatives had always voted for Republicans, and they continued to vote for Republicans under Trump. But the voters that he peeled off from Democrats in places like Michigan and Wisconsin were what won him the election. I also wonder if there's something unique about the playing field in the United States that allowed someone like Trump, and I suppose by extension now the Republican Party, to win without growing the tent. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the political landscape here is such that you don't have to win a majority, um, you know, that geography matters, uh, that your coalition can be smaller than the other side's coalition to win. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a disincentive then, I suppose, to diversify in a way that there is perhaps more of an incentive in places like France or the UK um, to grow your tent. But then I suppose the, the extension of that is, is what 
you know, particularly Le Pen is doing in France, is it just a Trojan horse in pursuit of an end? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure I fully agree in the sense that, yes, you can win without a popular majority in the U.S. because of the Electoral College, especially in ter- if you look at the Senate, you can determine policy despite having representing far fewer voters. But Trump did grow the tent in some sense, mm-hmm. if not in absolute numbers in terms of the states that he managed to win that had been traditionally Democratic. Right. So, you know, I'm from Michigan. Michigan had not gone Republican in my, you know, memory since since childhood that you know since or I, I think when i don't recall a republican ever winning but it probably uh if we go back to i guess when i was five and 84 um reagan right reagan i'm from wisconsin <laughs> yes yeah so you know it's a similar story right yeah, and yeah so play so so in 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 some respect there was a growing of the tent geographically, even though the margins were narrow. And that was, and even though he lost the popular vote, the, those turns in our two states were significant. And, and um, if not uh, the determinant of his win, a, a huge, a huge part of it along um, with a few other states. And so I think that's important. I think your, your question about Europe is interesting because you have a coalition system. You don't have to win a majority. You don't even have to come close to winning a majority in a lot of these countries uh, in order to um, exert real power if you're part of a coalition or even if you're not part of a coalition. And so mm-hmm. I think what we've seen in a lot of European countries, that, and this is an argument I make in the book and that I've made since, is that you don't have to win elections in order to win the debate. And what they've done in, in Denmark and the Netherlands, and what I would argue Le Pen has done to a certain extent but not absolutely in France, has pushed the entire debate to the right. So because the centrists have to defend against the threat from the far right, they start to adopt many of the policies advocated by the far right. So that's how you have a social democratic government in Denmark uh, making deals with African countries to process refugees uh, along the lines of what Britain's doing in Rwanda now, what Australia did for years with Pacific Island states. That's not something traditionally that one would have expected from a left-wing party, but they were so pressured by the far right that once in power, they feared losing voters to the far right and started to adopt many of their policies. And you see this happening all over the place now. Uh, You can even see it happening in places that are a bit off the radar in terms of the debate on immigration and xenophobia. For instance, Turkey, which will be heading into an election next year, which has a rising far-right politician who is having this effect on the political landscape in Turkey, uh, which has the largest refugee population in the world at the moment, with somewhere over 4 million Syrians. And while they welcomed them for a long time, that is becoming a political football now. Resentment is growing, and politicians of all stripes are starting to talk about sending them back, which is something new but almost inevitable in Turkish politics, because with high inflation and a strained economy, these sorts of candidates are going to find fertile ground for their arguments. So it's not something that is just limited uh, to to Western Europe and, and the United States. These kinds of arguments can take hold anywhere. And I think that the the tendency among journalists and academics to breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, they only got 10 percent or in the case of France, oh, well, she 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 still lost big. You know, she only got 40 something percent this time uh, misses the point, because if you manage to shift the terrain of the political debate, your ideas that were once fringe become mainstream, then you've effectively won without winning at the ballot box. So. This is a a legitimate observation that that most anti-immigrant attitudes are directed at people coming from places like developing countries um, and I suppose, or immigrants of color. And in the, the United States, this is Arabs, Muslims and Hispanics, and maybe, you know, increasingly lately Asian folks. Mm-hmm. And this is something that you talk about or that you mention in the book is that a lot of the policy preferences for anti-immigrant parties and politicians are unfairly targeting these folks. And I, I wonder if the policies would seem so... I guess, draconian if they were equitably applied to all immigrants. And that means regardless of their background or country of origin, their race Mm. or religion. And where I'm going with this is if it applied to white immigrants in the same way that it applies to immigrants of color. And 
I, I guess we're kind of seeing that dynamic play out now with Ukrainian refugees, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. It's a really interesting question. I have a few observations because I think that there are a number of examples that cut in different directions uh, to answer this. So the first one that comes to mind is Denmark and Sweden. And I'm not sure what the latest incarnation of, of Danish spouse visa immigration law is, but there was a point about a decade ago when the Danish government came under extreme pressure for having targeted Muslim immigrants with a very draconian law that effectively made it impossible to marry a spouse based outside of the country, which a lot of young uh, Pakistani immigrants and Syrian and other Middle Eastern immigrants were trying to do. And Turkish immigrants, they they would try to bring a spouse over and the Danes were trying to restrict this. And so it was a very targeted law that stopped these sorts of family reunifications, but they were criticized for it. And so they made it into a blanket law, which meant that if a Dane was marrying a white Canadian or a white Australian, they faced the same problem. And a lot of those couples started moving to Sweden, which is just a quick train ride away across the bridge from Copenhagen, Mm -hmm. because the blanket law caught so many people in its net who were unaccustomed to, um, to, to this kind of draconian law. And so that was one example of a state going too far in a very targeted and discriminatory direction and then casting a very wide net and then getting ridiculed even more because it was starting to affect people who actually had power and influence and were not willing to stand for it. Now, the mo- most interesting example, I think, is the UK. And if you look at pre-Brexit Britain and who was being ridiculed and who was resented by a certain element of the population. Yes, there was a lot of racist campaign literature prior to the Brexit referendum showing long lines of mostly brown foreigners uh, used as a scare tactic and saying, you know, they're coming, or pictures of people coming in boats across the channel, which is still being used in the tabloids here. Uh-huh. So that there was part of, that was part of the Brexit campaign. But what tends to, to be forgotten these days is there were huge, huge numbers of Bulgarians, Poles, Romanians, and other Eastern Europeans working in the UK prior to Brexit. And they were picking vegetables and fruit in the fields. They were working as Uber drivers. They were working as truck drivers. They were working in slaughterhouses. They were doing a lot of low-wage jobs that many British workers weren't keen to take. And yes, there were plenty of non-white immigrants in these industries too. But as a result of, of, of the sheer numbers of Eastern Europeans who took advantage of freedom of movement, when Britain was still part of the EU, there was a tremendous amount of anti-Eastern European racism and discrimination among uh, the British population, especially working class Brits, not just white ones, mind you, uh, you know, the working class generally. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of vitriol directed towards these populations who, of course, were all white for the most part. And so, so there was like quite a complex form of xenophobia in, in this country prior to Brexit. And it's very noticeable now that a lot of those people are gone. Some of them who were able to get permanent residency and, and settle here are still here. But the numbers of, of hotel workers, farm workers, uh, truck drivers from those Eastern European countries, people in the construction trade, a lot of them have left because they had to under Brexit, or it was just too onerous uh, to to get the the paperwork to stay. And and they've gone, which has had all sorts of consequences for the British economy. But it's a reminder that this can be directed uh, at at, at, at any population. It can also happen in countries like South Africa, where Xenophobia is rife, but it's directed by black people against other black people, namely African immigrants who've come to South Africa. And South Africa, for the last decade or so, has had a series of violent clashes and and um, essentially pogroms and lynchings of Zimbabwean and Somali and other immigrants 
by native South Africans. Everyone's black, so it doesn't get noticed in the way that white on black or white on brown racism gets noticed, but it's it's extremely dangerous, it's extremely violent, and it's very scary because there also is a rising star in South African politics now who's trying to instrumentalize this and take advantage of it. And like Turkey, South Africa is a country that's ripe for this because people want a scapegoat when the economy is imploding. And so this is all to say that the traditional model that we tend to think of when we think of xenophobia doesn't apply everywhere. It does apply in Poland with Ukrainian refugees now, which was your initial example. And this is, you know, quite a jarring thing, because if you remember less than a year ago, the Polish army was massing on the border uh, as Belarus tried to opportunistically weaponize migrants from Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East and send them across the border into the EU. And Prior to that, before Belarus started its its operation of of disruption uh, along that border, there were plenty of African and and Asian uh, and Middle Eastern migrants trying to make their way into the EU across that border. And the Poles were extremely strict and extremely harsh in the way that they treated them. And as soon as millions of Ukrainians started to stream across the border, that changed. And so some people would rightly, in my view, argue that there was a double standard and that the Poles were welcoming fellow white Christians from a neighboring country while they were chasing away Sudanese and Afghans, who in many cases were fleeing just as legitimately as the Ukrainians. But it it also shows that countries with a bloody and not-so-friendly history can change their outlook and uh, that seems to be what Poles have done for the time being, at least uh, in accepting large numbers of Ukrainians. But I'm not sure it's going to last forever. I wouldn't be surprised if this goes on for five years, if at some stage you start to see the same kind of resentment in Poland as we saw in Britain with Eastern Europeans. So at one point, you write uh, in reference to the French legislation banning the burqa that Quote, rather than fine every modestly clad Muslim at the beach, France needs to come to term with the multicultural nation it's become and refrain from turning to the police to enforce secular morals, end quote. And I'm wondering if, I mean, wouldn't the party, and so this is in France, the National Front, or at least that's what it was known as, I think it's known now as the National Rally. Yeah. Wouldn't their response, you know, the nationalist response be, I mean, essentially, no, we don't. I mean, essence, isn't this their argument that they shouldn't have to come to terms with multiculturalism? And I, and I know you'd address this in the book, but I'm wondering if you could expound on it here. It's an interesting question. And I think what it comes down to is a debate between civic nationalists and ethnic nationalists. So it's one thing to say that we feel cultural loss. And this is the phrase that often gets used. Uh, It's a phrase that was used in the US during the civil rights movement. It's a phrase that you hear quite a lot in European countries. You know, we are not who we once were. Our culture is disappearing. All of these foreigners are coming in. We hear more Turkish than German on the streets of Berlin. Uh, We hear more Arabic than French on the streets of Paris, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that There is a legitimate argument on the right about culture and preservation of culture if the argument is we want to be able to talk to our neighbors, for instance. So someone who complains and says, I speak English, but all of my neighbors now speak Arabic or Urdu, and I don't feel at home in my own neighborhood anymore. The person making that argument may or may not be racist. I think they often are. But there are state policies, and they're implemented in many countries, uh, that seek to address this and say, okay, there are people who speak lots of different languages, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we're going to create a lingua franca, and we have an official state language, so we're going to make sure that everyone learns it. So even in, in some of these countries we've discussed that have fairly reactionary refugee policies these days, like Denmark, you know, they do offer language training and it's considered an essential thing. And Germany's trying to do this too, um, and has been since the Syrian refugees arrived, saying like, okay, everyone's going to learn German and the state is going to assure that because that's how we integrate people and get them ready for the job market uh, and make 
a cohesive society. And I think that that is legitimate and it reflects a commitment. It, it may be nationalist, but it reflects a commitment to a civic form of nationalism, which is we want to have a national identity and we will defend our national identity, but anyone can be part of this nation. You don't have to be white, you don't have to be Christian, but you should speak English or German if you're going to live in Britain or Germany. That's one approach. But the ethnic nationalist approach is to say, we are a white Christian nation. We should always remain a white Christian nation. And therefore, we cannot accept a growing population of Jews or Muslims or Hindus. And that is where a lot of these nativist uh, policies come from. And what I think is the underlying ideology of many of these parties. And they sometimes try to mask that ethnic nationalism with rhetoric that sounds like a commitment to civic nationalism. But if you dig deeper and if you listen to them at their campaign rallies and you listen to some of the policies that they're advocating for, like stripping people of citizenship, making it more difficult for immigrants to acquire citizenship, or another thing that's happening in Denmark at the moment, repatriation is the friendly way of saying it, but deportation is the more accurate way of saying it, of Afghan refugees who came to Denmark, Syrian refugees who came to Denmark fleeing war, and suddenly the state declaring, we're going to send them back because Syria is safe now, mm. Afghanistan's safe now, which of course is a joke, but the state makes that determination. And then people who have lived in Denmark or one of these other advanced European countries for their entire adult life is suddenly sent back to a war zone. So I think that that is the distinction that's important here, is whether your commitment when you say, we want to preserve our culture, we don't want to experience cultural loss, whether the driving force behind that statement is a commitment to an ethnic form of nationalism or a civic one. Because a civic form of nationalism can welcome and encompass all of these groups with the goal of turning them into French people, you know, turning them into productive French citizens who are included in the nation or productive German citizens who are fully included in the nation rather than excommunicating them or sidelining them. And so I think that that, that is the key. And I, I want to say one other thing about it, because I think that there's also, this goes back to your first question about, you know, small d democracy, majoritarianism and, and liberal democracy. There's also a, a longing for a bygone era implicit in this. And so, you know, if, if a French person says, you know, we don't want to see people wearing uh, a, a burkini or we don't want to see any form of veil uh, anywhere and we don't want to hear uh, Arabic or Urdu on the street. It's a nostalgia for an era that hasn't existed for decades, right? If you look at France in the 1960s, people were speaking foreign languages. There were people of different religions. And, and you see this in the U.S. too, this sort of hearkening back to this kind of leave it to beaver era of sort of pristine white, you know, rural or suburban life. And um, it doesn't exist and it hasn't existed for a long time. And so the, the imagined community is actually a fiction. It, it, it hasn't ever been like that. The U.S. has been a very diverse nation for a very long time. There were Asian immigrants, you know, coming, coming to the U.S. in the 19th century. Um, and, and so I think that a lot of these groups, when they express a nostalgia f f for, for this supposed nation, they're actually expressing nostalgia for something that, that has, has never existed, uh, or at least in the last century has not re existed. And so it's not even really nostalgia at that point. It's, it's sort of imagining a regression um, to, to, to something that hasn't existed for, for many, many years. And so I think that what, what I'm arguing in the book is, yes, you, you can protect your culture to some extent and you can set certain boundaries, but uh, to pretend that there's never been anyone who spoke a different language or had a different faith um, is ridiculous. And it, it, it doesn't have any basis in, in recent history. These countries have been multicultural in one way or another for a very long time. And yes, uh, they've become more multicultural in recent years. And there is a legitimate debate to be had over the pace of immigration and the number of immigrants that come in in any given year. And that, I think, is an important debate and, again, is a place where people on the right have a point.
And again, it goes back to the civic versus ethnic nationalism question that we were talking about a moment ago. It's one thing to say, we can admit 20,000 refugees per year in Denmark, for instance, or in Germany, say we can admit 100,000 refugees per year because that's the number that we can manage to teach German, enroll in schools, put in job training programs, and successfully integrate into the society so that they can become productive and functioning citizens alongside the rest of us. But it's a very different thing to say, as many uh, of the writers like Eric Zemmour in France, who became a, a presidential candidate, and, you know, at one point, uh, the, the new face of the, the far right until Le Pen sort of pushed him aside in, in, in this year's election. But he wrote a book called The French Suicide a few years before I wrote my book, making all of these sorts of arguments that, you know, the nation is becoming polluted. Um, the most famous of these books was called The Great Replacement, which has become a household term now. But at the time that I wrote my book was an obscure French philosopher's idea that hardly anyone had heard about. And now suddenly it's on the reading list and in the manifesto of every mass shooter across the globe, uh, whether it's in New Zealand, the guy who, who murdered dozens of people at a mosque, or the more recent shootings in the U.S. and Buffalo, the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, the Great Replacement is suddenly the basis of all of these massacres. And the central argument there, again, is very similar, that our tradition and our population, our white native population, is being replaced by a new population and, and we, the natives, will cease to exist. And so you see this being deployed by far-right parties everywhere, and that is an ethnic nationalist vision. It's, it's a construction of the nation in ethnic and racial terms rather than in civic terms, meaning that only certain people can be part of it, only certain people can ever be part of it, because membership is based on blood rather than chosen membership within a, a national community. You know, I am struck by this argument about cultural loss, and I do want to follow this just a little bit further. Sure. So, I, you know, I do have, you know, I want to be careful with this. I do have some sympathy for an argument of maintaining some traditional social structures, you know, that, that societies and communities can be defined and envisioned through some lens that casts, you know, some unique aspect onto itself. So, you know, like, what does it mean to be French and not German? Or was it, what does it mean to be Spanish, not Italian? And I think you touched on this, these things can operate on some type of a spectrum or on a continuum, you know, culture can be measured very narrowly, you know, by how we dress, maybe, and it can be measured, you know, much more broadly, like maybe just our, you know, a measure of kindness that we, we extend to our neighbors, I don't know, by way of example. But what I'm interested in, though, is how we square this, or how could these concerns be addressed in a way that you know, I, I guess runs counter tangibly to whatever the Le Pens or the Trumps of the world are peddling mm. that could gain some real purchase with these voters. So your question really is sort of what policy measures could you advocate that respond to this concern, but do not cave to the liberal populists on a moral level? Right. No, I think I think that there are things that you can do, and I don't think that everything that uh, people who vote for far right parties worry about, I don't think everything they worry about is illegitimate. I think that their fears are often played upon mm. and exacerbated and stoked by nativist politicians. But there is a legitimate element underlying some of them, and I think that politicians. There are things that, that politicians can do to address some of these legitimate concerns without caving to the agenda of the nativist politicians. And so I think one way to do it is what I mentioned earlier, is say like, yes, there are certain baseline expectations uh, that we in Germany or that we in the Netherlands uh, expect of people who have residency in the country and they should learn German and they should learn Dutch and they should be able to participate in our schools and in our labor market. And we, the state, will facilitate that so that that integration is quicker and, and more effective. I think that there are things that can be done in labor markets, for instance, um, where there's resentment based on loss of jobs. And that can range from job retraining programs uh, to making it easier for 
immigrants and refugees to work legally. And this sounds like a bit of a contradiction, but I actually think that it could alleviate some of the problems because it's so hard for immigrants and refugees to work legally in so many countries. They tend to work under the table or on the black market and undercut the wages of the native population because they're paid by opportunistic uh, local businessmen and employers at cut rate wages thereby undermining the wages of the natives and creating even more resentment against them. So, you know, there there are things, and I think on on a very basic level, understanding and respecting the anxieties. Politicians, rather than dismissing it and saying you're a bunch of racists, you're a basket of deplorables, as Hillary Clinton (laughs) famously said, saying, yes, the country is changing. Some people have lost their jobs. Some people don't recognize the neighborhoods that they grew up in. Uh, We acknowledge this. We're going to try and ensure that you can get a well-paying job. We're going to try and ensure that you have health care. We're going to try and ensure that your children can go to a school that's not overcrowded. I think that sort of listening on a basic level rather than dismissing is quite helpful and in some places has helped centrist parties win back some of these voters. And I think that also being honest about it the way Angela Merkel was in Germany is helpful too. I mean, a million refugees came in um, during the Syrian crisis in, in 2015, and it was too much for Germany to handle, and it was an extreme strain, but she said, this is exceptional, we'll manage it. And even the detractors within her own party, who had tried to reduce the numbers or, or stop uh, such large numbers from coming in, their reaction was, we need to make this work, we need to integrate these people as effectively and and as quickly as possible. And I think that that uh, is also an important way of handling this uh, rather than simply dismissing the concerns or simply saying, like, this is going to be easy. There's no problem at all. Uh, You know, nothing's going to change, because I think that is what tends to rile up and, and really anger voters who are already primed to be resentful and distrustful of these sorts of policies. But I think it has to be done in a way that doesn't completely cave in to the agenda uh, of the far right parties by simply adopting their policies and saying, okay, we're going to start sending people back or, okay, we're going to start stripping people of their citizenship or we're going to restrict access to welfare benefits for new arrivals or people who have you know, not lived in the country for X number of years, because then I think you're flirting with some very illiberal solutions uh, that lead down a slippery slope to, to things that are much worse. Um, going back to, to your initial question, because I think this is where it leads, if you simply cater to the whims of the masses, that can lead to some very dangerous things. Uh, sometimes the masses demand mass expulsion of an entire population or even killing them. Mm -hmm. And so the guardrails that liberal democracies put in place for these sorts of situations so that even if a party with extreme views on immigration comes to power, that the institutions in a society are still strong enough to prevent uh, violent and and reactionary policies from from being implemented, that's important. And short of, of... these sort of violent or genocidal whims, which we see in places like Nazi Germany or the expulsions that occurred in a place like Uganda under Idi Amin or the 1990s in the Balkans, or we talked about the Philippine example earlier, um, you know, there are very scary, dangerous, violent consequences to simply allowing the the whim of the majority at any given moment uh, from turning into policy. And so I think that having those guardrails in place is extremely important, especially given that far-right nativist politicians are so close to coming to power in so many places and have even come to power in in several countries around the world. So you wrote this book before this year's French election and before Boris Johnson's kind of undoing in in the UK. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that this movement is very fluid, and I can't Mm -hmm. quite discern a pattern. So I I think the question is, what does the future look like in light of what we're seeing now? And and, and so in in France, we're seeing Le Pen performing a bit better 
with each election cycle. So is Le Pen a future French president? But then on the other side, Johnson not doing so well. So is Johnson an anomaly that then I suppose tempers this movement in his absence in the UK? That's not even considering Georgia Maloney in Italy and what's happening just in the last week or so. So do you see a pattern or is this just a very fluid movement? I think it's fluid. I don't think there's a definite pattern, but I think it's more useful to look at it as a pattern within each country rather than globally. I think we should leave Boris Johnson out of it altogether because I don't think he really fits the mold of of a true nativist uh, xenophobic far-right politician. He certainly relied on some of that sentiment and rode the wave of the Brexit vote to eventually gain power. But if you look, for instance, at Boris Johnson's cabinet, it, it was extremely diverse. Um, and he's, he's not a racist reactionary, even if he relied on the votes of some racist reactionaries. And so I don't think with a few exceptions, he was, all, he was trying to implement the sorts of policies that someone like Le Pen or Wilders or, or Maloney uh, would want to implement. Um, I think he was just far more opportunistic and, and the kind of politician who goes the way the wind blows. So leaving Johnson out of it, I think it's more useful to say, look at people like Trump, Salvini and Maloney in Italy, Le Pen, Wilders. Um, you know, these, these are people who really do fit the mold. And I think that in France... You know, Le Pen is improving each time around, and I don't think it's out of the question at all that, that she could win next time, especially because Macron cannot run again, um, and there's no obvious candidate mm-hmm. on the center-right, and the center-left in France has been completely decimated. So yes, she, she definitely would have a shot, and she got pretty close to, to 50% this time around. So... In France, it's, it's a very real possibility. In Italy, it's about to happen. I think that it's, it's highly likely that there'll be a right-wing coalition and Maloney is positioned to, to be at the head of that because she has outmaneuvered Salvini and Berlusconi is very old and uh, politically passé. And so she's <laughs> the rising star on the right and um, she's, she's likely to be heading the next government. And remember that her party, Brothers of Italy, is di- has a direct lineage back to, to the neo-fascist post-war years. And so she denies that and says that she's moderated in the same way that Marine Le Pen has. But um, she hasn't even disavowed that lineage to the extent that Le Pen has in France. And so I think there's a real risk in Italy that, that some of these sorts of policies will, will become mainstream in the same way that they started to become uh, state policy um, when, when Salvini was close to, to power and, and, and influencing um, the previous government. So, you know, the, the pattern within countries is quite clear to me. And I think in many of them, these parties are still on the rise. They had a little hiccup during the pandemic because so many of them were kind of incompetent uh, in, their, in their handling of the pandemic. And they didn't really manage it in, uh, in a competent and effective way. And I think that that hurt them at the polls. But with that seeming to have passed now, I think people have pretty quickly forgotten. And the same issues that they used to mobilize in the past are, are working for them again. In the U.S., briefly, I think that a lot of this uh, is still very ripe for Trump or a successor, an ideological successor to Trump to take advantage of and, and mobilize people. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if in the 2024 campaign we see a resurgence of nativism and backlash against immigration, whether it's Trump or not. Uh, I think that he proved that that can be a, a very effective mobilizing issue and saying things that were once considered beyond the pale in the Republican Party actually managed to help Republicans win in places that they hadn't previously had a chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, a final question. Yeah. As always, so what is something interesting you've been watching, reading, listening to, or doing lately? And it doesn't have to be related to this topic. I I just read a novel called Spies in Canaan by an Irish writer whose name I'm blanking on at the moment. And it's sort of set in the last days of Saigon uh, and narrated by 
a sort of low level CIA operative who is engaged in various activities ranging from moral to immoral as South Vietnam falls, and then sort of reminisces on this many decades later in the novel. And I was reading it sort of alongside editing articles about the war in Ukraine, and specifically sort of anniversary pieces on the fall of Kabul in Afghanistan. And it sort of got me thinking uh, about the parallels between those two historical moments. And I know the analogy has been made before, and it obviously does have some, some relation to the topic that we're talking about in the sense that uh, both of those events produced mass refugee outflows. But reading it in the form of a novel rather than uh, an op-ed or sort of straight, straightforward political analysis, which is what I spend so much of my time doing, was, was refreshing on some level because it brings out um, the moral and philosophical dilemmas faced by people in these moments who are trying to do good in a situation that makes that almost impossible. Dr. Polakow Saransky, I think this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time and chatting with me today. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed it. After this miniseries, I feel like I understand this nationalist movement in that I have a clarity around the demands, the fear, and the anger. But I still think it represents people grasping for low-hanging fruit on complex issues. And perhaps worse, it reflects the relentless work of elite politicians. People like Donald Trump in the United States, Marine Le Pen in France, Georgia Maloney in Italy, Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, preying on the fears and anxieties of their country folk. And in end, in the final analysis, the countries they seek to craft will rain down horrors and violence and deprivations that cannot be checked. They will ruin the lives, the legacies, and the futures of everyone, not just their specific targets of derision and exclusion. It seems at this point that we are teetering on the edge of some global collapse of democracy and democratic ideals. And even for those of you that find democracy as having produced little substance and poor outcomes... I ask you to imagine the world that fills its void. Democracy is not perfect. It is messy. In fact, that's one of its obvious challenges. Democracy requires attention and dedication and investment. And I fear that we've become such commodified convenience cultures and with little motivation to maturely process our emotions and reactions that we just can't be bothered. And it is in part this that has created fertile ground for democratic predators to flood the valley. In the United States, I have the distinct feeling that a 2024 Trump candidacy or any Republican candidacy in the mold of Trump will have moved, at least in part, away from the nativist messaging of 2016 that was rooted in blood and soil American identity, which functionally just means white Christians slash supremacists, to a nativism rooted in party identification that the them that doesn't belong and doesn't deserve any rights or protections is Democrats or more broadly, liberals. This would mark a significant turn in our politics, one that mirrors fascist takeovers in other countries, obviously Nazi Germany, but also Italy under Mussolini, Chile under Pinochet, Russia under Stalin and now Putin, and Venezuela under Hugo Chavez. But there is still hope, and so I've asked my guests their thoughts. Dr. Hochschild suggests tapping into a patriotism, a sense of shared values that isn't limited to blood and soil. Dr. Gorski suggests that the body politic and the body civic need to double down on work at the state level, and also that we should promote and encourage the work of Christian voices condemning this turn toward fascism, nationalism, and xenophobia as what it is, unchristian. And Dr. Polakow Saransky suggests that leftist politicians can listen to these concerns and these anxieties of its citizens without immediate condemnation, and instead offer very tangible policies that address those concerns without advancing cruel, nativist, or xenophobic narratives or embracing autocracy and authoritarianism. Okay, next week I'm talking to Radmila Sigol, an editor, translator, and associate professor at the National Technical University of Ukraine. She's also a friend of mine, and she lives in Kiev. We will talk about Putin's war, the impact it has had on her daily life, as well as that of her friends and family, 
the illogical justifications for the invasion and how that plays in Ukraine, if Ukrainians can ever forgive Russia, and what she expects the future will look like in Ukraine. In the meantime, as always, if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, you can email me at deepdivewithshawn at gmail.com. And you can find me on Twitter at deepdivesean and on Instagram at deepdivewithshawn. Chat soon, folks. 